I'll be reading scripture from Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 through 53. This is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already ablaze. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, I have come to bring division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We recently had a Bible study class. Um, we tend to have our Bible studies on Wednesdays via Zoom. And we were studying Psalm 51. This was written by David. And it's known as a Psalm of the Covenant. Because he was so very sorrowful about his behavior and what he had done. He'd fallen in love with a married woman. Her husband had gone to battle, and he sent her husband to the front lines because he wanted him to die. And sure enough, he was killed. So David married the wife, impregnated her, impregnated her and um, they gave, she gives birth to a son, and then the son dies. On our Bible study, we were discussing how we tend to mourn because of our misdeeds, and how our misdeeds influence those around us, and how we tend to dwell on those effects. And then that morphed into a discussion about how interesting it is when negative things happen to us, that we hold on to them and they make deep impressions in our brains. When somebody says something negative about us or to us, we hold on to that. Even though so many positive things happen to us, there are so many positive things that people say about us and we just put them into our subconscious. But the negative things stay right in the forefront. It's like we bury the positives, which I thought was very interesting. Kind of odd, right? But you know, that's how our brain is designed. Scientists have proved that things, negative experiences, negative comments, tend to stimulate the neurons within the brain. And they tend to to make a deeper impact in our brains than the positive impacts. The negative impacts seep into our brains, whereas the positive impacts just come onto the surface, which I thought was very interesting. A psychologist was doing a study about if people, about people who lost $50, and they would ruminate on that forever. Or, however, if they won $50, that would quickly move into the, out of the forefront of their minds. In another study, people were asked about their childhoods and how they were raised. And they wanted us, they wanted people to tell stories. And people came out with all the negative stories that had happened. Even though they had had an awesome childhood, they still remembered so many of the negative incidents that happened in their childhood, and they couldn't remember any positive stories. Some experts say the reason for this is that our ancient ancestors had to be on the lookout for, uh, for 
robbers and all kinds of dangers in the world. In the world, you know the story of the Good Samaritan. The thieves were hiding with, uh, among the rocks, and then they hurt the, some, the uh, traveler. Also, you know, back in the, in the day, people had to be afraid of lions and tigers and bears. And so they had to be on the lookout to survive and live longer. And so the negatives made big impressions in their minds. For example, they would know that if there was a lot of rocks, there could be thieves hiding there. And maybe they would see beautiful flowers and smell them and enjoy that. But if they just ruminated on that, they would die earlier because they would not have learned how to pay attention to things that were dangerous and therefore would have a negative impact on them. It's so fascinating and so cool and so cool that we can know that there is no separation really between church and science because we are so complexly made. And the more science find out, finds out, the more fascinating it is. You know, we have to take care of ourselves and we are aware of when situations are dangerous or people can be dangerous. But I really, really dislike ruminating on the bad things that I've been. I just think about it and it just goes, gets on a, it could be something that happened 20 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, and I am still thinking about it. And somebody say, oh, you remember, I wish that I had cooked more. Oh, I wish that I, but my children would say, mom, I have no memory of that at all. But yet, I do. And I still do that, and I hate that I do that, because that makes me feel so bad. And I just need to shake that stuff off. There is no perfect parent. There is no perfect person, of course. Everyone makes mistakes and says dumb things, right? We all do that. But psychologists say that there are some benefits to us remembering the negative and holding on to that, because they teach us how to not do that again, how to not say those things again, how to become more kind in our speech, more kind and tolerant. You know, if we forget everything that we do, we'll just repeat the behavior over and over. But if we hold it in the forefront of our minds, we will avoid it. And that's true. You know, we will try to avoid being impatient and instead become patient. Instead of tearing down, we will try to build up. And you know, there are ways to talk about how not to tear people or things down. And so I'm glad when I, when I realize how not to tear down, and I'm glad that those things come to mind. And you know, in the text that we just read, Jesus is doing just that. But you know, I know this text can seem very odd, that Jesus did not come to bring peace. Jesus came to bring division. We just say, what is this about? Jesus is the one who said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus said, I have come so that you might have life more than abundantly. You heard the message, hate your neighbor, but I am telling you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But if you read the gospel, you will discover that Jesus' teaching were very clear. But sometimes Jesus' teachings were a little confusing. They seemed like they were diametrically opposed. You say you don't bring peace? You came to bring division to us? That seems odd. You want to bring fire upon the world? What is that all about? You told your disciples to throw away, and now you're saying to bring fire? In Matthew, it says, I have come not to bring peace.
peace, but I have come to bring a sword. But you told the disciples to sheathe their swords and put them away. You know, in verse 49, it started with fire, right? And we see the word fire in the gospel several times. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist says, The Messiah will come after me. He will not baptize with water, but he will baptize the Holy Spirit with fire. Okay, okay, so that's a positive image. Matthew also says that his fork, you know, like a farmer's fork, his fork will winnow the grain, and he will separate the wheat from the chaff, and the chaff will fade away, and the grain will grow to the ground. So the good will be kept and the chaff will be discarded. The chaff is what will be thrown into the burning fire. So the chaff is like the bad, bad stuff. And we will, the grain will be retained. So we understand that fire is symbolic. And during Jesus' time, it was essential that grain be winnowed. So that the grain was heavier and it would fall to the ground, whereas the chaff would blow away. That way the grain could be collected and harvested. <coughs> and then once the storehouses were full, the chaff was gone. There's another example of a, a fire as a, um, referring to hell. That's a little confusing. And Jesus used this example on his own. He mentioned fire and hell, but he used the word Gana when he says hell. He uses the word Gehanna. And Gehanna, I have seen this. It's, this is in Israel, in Jerusalem, I believe, on the west side of the gate. That gate is called Gehanna. And you know, they would, where the people um, live in Jerusalem, they would actually bring in fire. And it smelled horrible. But it's a constant fire. The fire burns constantly in that part of Jerusalem at both the gate of Gehanna and then the other gate where the people live. They talk about people hearing animals grinding their teeth. And you know, wild animals would gather there and when they do, they could hear their uh, teeth grinding. And I thought that was interesting. So that was another term for fire of Gehanna. You know, in this morning's text, Jesus uses the symbol of fire not for judgment, but as a way of cleaning up and purifying. I think that Jesus wanted all that we have inside of us, intellectually and emotionally and behaviorally, and what we say, that those are the things that block us and prevent us from following the way of Jesus, that prevent us from loving all people, that those are what Jesus wants to get out and throw into the fire. When children are murdered in schools, that behavior is trash. When women are raped and, people, and beaten every eight seconds from a male, that's refuse. When, people are so, when children are sold for sex, that is chaff. And all that needs to be cast into the fire and burned up. But you know what? We all have something inside of ourselves, right? We all have to take that out, name it, own it, and realize what it is, and then throw it into the fire. Maybe it's racist thinking. 
Maybe it's oppression on women. Maybe it's hate for a specific group of people. Maybe it's fear of another group of folks. Maybe it's disgust. Maybe there's bitterness or jealousy. We all have something inside of us that needs to be taken out of our hearts and minds and cast into the fire and burned up so that we can become more and more Christ-like. I did look into somebody in a restaurant who said, um, people are talking and saying that everyone has some kind of a racism within them. But, you know, people say that, but I don't believe it. And I just looked at this person and said, well, yeah, we do. We all are guilty of that, of thinking the wrong way, applying to a group of stereo, applying a stereotype to a group of people. I know I've done it. We all do it. Sometimes we are self-centered. Sometimes we just think about ourselves. Sometimes we need to forgive people, but sometimes we won't. Sometimes we seek revenge. Really. We all have something inside of us that we need to unpack and cast into the fire and burn up. So I think this, this uh, symbolism of this is that when Jesus came, Jesus came to help us delve deep, get that stuff out, burn it, and change. Sometimes we can be too hard on ourselves. Sometimes we're perfectionistic. Sometimes we want to be better. We want to be prettier. Sometimes we <coughs> criticize ourselves and beat ourselves up. And we look into the mirror to feel like we don't measure up. All of that needs to be cast into the fire. Really, we create hell for ourselves right here on Earth. Right? We create hell for the folks around us because of our thinking and our behavior, and those thoughts and behaviors affect those around us. We talked about that in the Bible study. So Jesus came to come into our life, to winnow it out, to get rid of the chaff, and to leave the good, and get the bad stuff away. And we all need that process. So you think this is an odd passage that Jesus said, I came to winnow and get rid of the chaff and keep the good for each and every one of you. Oh, that is touching. Do you know that an aim for fire is the same word as it is for the Holy Spirit? Did you know that? And wind. Fire, wind, and Holy Spirit are the same Hebrew word, ruha. Ruha. That's used for fire, for Holy Spirit. <coughs> and wind. Isn't that cool? Jesus came. Jesus comes into our life and says, hey, I'm here to dig up the bad and put it in the fire. And I wish the fire was already consuming those things so you would not have to suffer. Well, it's hard to delve deep and deal with our sins and our past behavior, our memories, our trauma. But Jesus knows, and Jesus is touched and says, I am so sorry. I wish I could dig this out, winnow it away, and let the fire consume that, and then you would just have peace. Jesus wants us to have a peaceful life. Jesus wishes that we can become people that he intends us to be. But we aren't there yet. What, we're not, we have not grown into what Jesus has intended us to be. Not yet. You know, people should be running to church because they see us acting in love and mercy and compassion. Then we know that we are becoming what Jesus intends us to be. Better people. Christ life. Jesus will walk right beside us. Jesus will immerse himself into our pain. Jesus will immerse himself into our bad stuff. 
We do not have to go through those experiences alone. Never, ever. I know it seems weird that Jesus said, I came to bring fire and vision. But Jesus also said, I came to be baptized. And the baptized he was speaking of was the crucifixion. And he was very transparent. He said, I will be going through a great deal of stress because of that for me to face. You know, and he was baptized by water in the Jordan with river. And then at John, the disciples were talking about someone who wanted to sit on their right and someone on their left when they got to heaven. Jesus saw that and responded and said, you have no idea what you're really asking me. Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you baptize in the baptism that I will endure? Jesus wanted to know that those two would go to the cross and suffer crucifixion, just as Jesus did. Because Jesus knew that he would be crucified. And that's what he was referring to by using the term in that situation of baptism. We don't always get glory and power immediately. Sometimes we have to die to ourselves to winnow that out and do what's right. Jesus knows. Jesus gave up his life for people. And he was transparently saying, I am stressed because I know so soon I will be crucified. And it sounds like sometimes we give up our lives for the gospel. But when Jesus said, I came to earth, not to bring peace, but to bring division, he meant that following Jesus does not mean that our life is going to be a piece of cake. That is not what he meant. The Roman kings had just announced that all of the Jewish people were under the domain of Rome. And, they, and he said, I bring you peace and tranquility. But that was called the Pax Romana. It was not a true peace. It was not a true experience of tranquility. Because there was such a dichotomy between the poor and the rich. And the people with disabilities got absolutely nothing. It was a horrendous sign. Women were subjugated. It was a horrible time for them. There was no peace in the Pax Romana at all. So Jesus did not bring that type of peace like Rome did. Jesus did not bring artificial peace for people who were living under oppression. Jesus brought peace that every human deserves to have. Jesus brought the new world order that was not ruled by vice or threat. Threat. He brought a new world order that was ruled by love and forgiveness. Not by power, but by humility. Not through fear, but through faith. The church has to stop threatening people. It has to become welcoming for people. Jesus knew that his teaching would cause division. That's what he was talking about. He said, I came, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring division. Because I know that those of you who follow me will have your families divided. When people in Jesus' own family found out that he was not subscribing to the Pax Romana or the Roman way of life, they thought he was crazy and asked him, what is wrong with you? So he was talking from his own personal experience. His own family could not understand why he was saying things like love everyone, why he would eat with women and tax collectors and gamblers. 
His siblings actually thought he was crazy. <coughs> they did. So Jesus caused division. And Jesus said he would be causing division. So that passage really is not confusing. It does make sense. Jesus is saying, hey, I am come here. I am in you, and you are in me, and now I am separating the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad, letting the good rain down on all of you, and letting the bad just go and be burnt out. So that's what I came for. Please forgive yourselves. Forgive others. And remember, my message of loving everyone will cause division. It will. Jesus didn't want division, but he knew there were so many people who would not accept that idea of love. Love for everyone. They would say, well, no, I hate these folks and those folks and those folks. And there would be division. Jesus knew that people wouldn't forgive, wouldn't accept forgiveness. They would say, how can I forgive this person after what they did to me? You're crazy. Again, there was division. People would say, you want me to include these folks and those folks and that group? There is no way I'm including them. They are sinners. Once again, division. Jesus knew. And today, we know and understand division, right? I mean, wow. I am learning too. I am learning right with y'all. What it means to be 100% inclusive and loving and kind. I am learning right along with all of you. Never shut the door to God's house. Never. We, the church, have caused division. Not from Jesus' message of love, but from our wrong responses, right? You know, I've talked with a lot of deaf folks from the LGBTQ community, and they have been ostracized from their families, from their parents. Their churches have kicked them out. My own father was kicked out of his deaf church many years ago because he divorced. They took his keys. He was proud of his service, mowing the church. His best friend from the school for the deaf was the one who came to take his key from him, and that just killed him. So many people don't know Christ's love. They don't know what the love of Jesus is supposed to look like. Some people who have um, interracial marriages are ostracized from their family. We've got some families here who have gone through that. You would be shocked. Families have left other people out because they have married people from different economic statuses. What is going on? People who do those type of things are not following the message of Jesus. There is division. Jesus preached love and forgiveness, and that can cause division. Do you see how that works? We need God to help us burn all of the stuff inside of us that injures other people. All of it. And all of us. Don't think we don't have any, because we do. Don't be the kind of Christian that wants to live in the Pax Romana under a false peace. Don't be the type of Christian that wants to close the door on someone. Don't be the kind of Christian who resists Jesus' winnowing. Don't just put him up and say, hey, I'm okay, I'm right. I've got the right to hate this folk, these folks. You just leave me alone. Don't separate my wheat from my chaff. But let's work together and invite Jesus 
to separate and burn the bad. Amen? Amen. Amen.